Many are called, but few are chosen. Living faith must have active feet to complete the race. Otherwise, you are only an outer court spectator. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, seeing we are also surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily ensnare us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter or finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And we are called to walk in the same. That's why the upward call of God in Christ is perfectly unveiled in Hebrews chapter 12. And Jesus is the example. The upward call of God in Christ was demonstrated in the life of Jesus. Because we are called to mature as manifested sons. And after he completed his race through his example, he sat down at the right hand of the Father and he presents the overcomer a place with him in his throne. But we must compete according to the rules laid down in Philippians 2, Philippians 3, Hebrews 12, and Mark 10, verse 37 to 40. You see, and this is why it is said in Philippians 2, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ, for the joy set before him endured the cross. He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, therefore God exalted him to the highest place. And we are called to walk in the same. Philippians 3, it is demonstrated in the life of the Apostle Paul as a forerunner, forgetting the things that are behind, and I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me, answering the upward call of God in Christ unto fruitful, mature, overcoming sonship. And then we are crowned with a victor's crown. We have to complete the race first. This is why Jesus says in Revelation 3.21, To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. Many fail to realize that we have a position or place of authority, Ephesians 1. God raised us up and seated us in heavenly places. It's a positional place of authority given to us through the finished work of his cross, which then must become an experiential reality worked in us as we seek to have a truthful testimony as an overcomer. And this is why Philippians 1.6 says, He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's a good work that has been worked, where, that has been wrought out in those who t take up their cross. We are, we are the workmanship of God. This is what Jesus meant in Mark 10, 37. They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one at your right hand and the other on your left hand in your glory. Notice in his glory. Glorified sonship. It's the second Corinthians three glory that must be wrought out in those who live in pursuit of God from glory to glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. That is why it's the same as Isaiah 60, arise, shine your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. That's the glory realm being opened up and those to be revealed as the manifested sons. 
It's the coming kingdom within the sons. Give that we are seated with you, one at your left hand and right hand in your glory. Then Jesus said to them, you don't know what you are asking. Can you drink from the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm to be baptized with? The baptism is that baptism of fire by which we are perched from the dross of our own ways. And the baptism. Oh, the baptism is that baptism of fire by which we are purged from the dross of our own ways through various trials. And the cup is the Gethsemane cup of self-denial. We choose to suffer laying down our will, which is in rebellion against God's will, so that the will of God might be wrought out in us, by which he is glorified and we being rewarded with an eternal weight of glory as manifested sons of God. Procrastination is the devil's playground. God, through a powerful open vision, showed me the Gideon army bowed down and on their faces before his throne, and these soldiers were drinking from his river in adoration and worship because they hungered and thirst after righteousness and holiness. These were not preoccupied by the things of this world, then the great God Yahweh said to me, Many are called, but only few are chosen. Many are called, but so few humble themselves to come down to the water level of humility, to drink from the flow of my river, so I might raise them up, as Paul said to Timothy, a good soldier of Jesus Christ. As with Gideon's army, God will sift out this generation and raise up an army unto himself that will do, at his, that will do his bidding. There's much that must be added to our lives after we are saved by grace through faith if we desire to become useful in the kingdom of God. Salvation is only the beginning. Faith without obedience is dead and meaningless. Second Peter 1 Peter 5 And for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, who are grow we grow to become like him through our knowledge of him as we spend time daily in his presence through personal relationship. You get to know somebody when you spend time with that person. Verse 9, but he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Therefore, rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you, will never, you shall never fail, or you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be provided unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Are you a disciple or just a born-again civilian? There's a vast difference between a nominal born-again civilian who lives a distracted life because he loves this world more than God, who sleeps away his spiritual life and do, and a good soldier of Jesus Christ that submit himself to God's boot camp training or spiritual discipline. There's a vast distinction between common vessels of earthenware and vessels set apart unto the Lord for noble purposes. Also understand, remember there's the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. Also understand, if you desire to attain to and win the victor's crown of the overcomer, then you must finish the race first of the upward call of God in Christ, by which we are called to grow into that measure of his full stature, spoken of in Philippians 2, Philippians 3, Ephesians 4, and Hebrews 12. You must abide by and compete according to the rules, or you will be disqualified. We are in a struggle by which we compete with our sinful fall and flesh to bring it into subjection by the operation and the power of the Spirit 
in our lives and we are in a wrestling match with the Ephesians 6 forces of darkness. Remember, you just to be a born-again civilian, distracted by the affairs of this life, if you become a soldier of Jesus Christ. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the vows of the devil. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in our places. We are called to overcome. Are you giving diligence to make your calling and election sure? We have a race to complete. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run the very best to win, but only one receives the prize? Run your race in such a way that you may seize the prize and make it yours. Now, every athlete who goes into training and competes in the games is disciplined and exercises self-control in all things. They do it to win a crown that withers, but we do to receive an imperishable crown that cannot wither. Therefore, I do not run without a definite goal. I do not flail around like one beating the air. In other words, shadow boxing. But, I, but like a boxer, I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave. And this comes even through prayer and fasting. So that after I've preached the others, the gospel to others, I myself will not somehow be disqualified as unfit for service. Second Timothy 2, take with me, Paul says to Timothy, your share of hardship passing through the difficulties which you are called to endure like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier in active service gets entangled in the ordinary business affairs of civilian life. He avoids them so that he may please the one who enlisted him to serve. And if anyone competes as an athlete in competitive games, he is not crowned with the wreath of glory unless he competes according to the rules. Now, in a large house, there are not only vessels and objects of gold, silver, but also vessels and objects of wood and of earthenware. And some are for honorable, noble good, Use and some for dishonorable, ignoble, or common use. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things which are dishonorable, disobedient, sinful, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, set apart for a special purpose and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Run away from youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those believers who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Understand that you are no threat to the kingdom of darkness when you are settled in your heart and complacent lifestyle of carnality and when you are imprisoned and driven by fleshly lusts. We are cleansed through the washing of the water of God's word as we apply it in humble obedience to our lives. Otherwise, we stay spiritually blind. 1 Peter 1.22, seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit to unfeigned love of the brothers, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which lives and stays forever. Now, God wants to bring forth a harvest of righteousness through the seed of your life. It's not just about getting saved, then go on living for yourself, being driven and enslaved and imprisoned by our own desires. God's kingdom is a kingdom of multiplication. Matthew, Matthew 3, 7. But when Jesus saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned but when John saw, sorry, generation of vipers who want you to flee from the coming wrath, bring forth therefore fruits befitting for repentance. In other words, show that you have converted yourselves towards God by turning away from your willful sinning, especially the sins that leads to death like fornication. And think not that, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. 
For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Indeed, I baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who comes after me is mightier than I, referring to Jesus. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into his barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. We must allow ourselves to be perched from the dross of our own ways on the threshing floor of the Father, so he might bring forth the life of Jesus in us, which are the peaceful fruits of righteousness. Otherwise, we stay undisciplined, unruly, lawless sons and daughters that live in rebellion against God. Hebrews 12, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you, as unto children, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chastens not? But if you are without chast chastening, chastisement of which all are partakers, then you are legitimate children and not sons. And he says, while we undergo discipline, it's painful and not joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness unto them who are trained by it. Therefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any immoral or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright, Many today are selling the kingdom birthright like Esau for the pot of lentils, which speaks of fleshly desires. In other words, they live for themselves. They're born again. They love God. They are saved, but they live to satisfy their flesh, the pot of lentil soup. And by doing that, they forfeit the kingdom birthright of becoming a functioning heir and an overcomer that will be counted worthy to sit with Christ in his throne. This is the context of this Hebrews 12. God's kingdom is a ruling kingdom. It's not for babes or toddlers, but for those who are brought to maturity. It is a righteous work wrought out and accomplished in us by the spirit of holiness. The only responsibility we owe the flesh is to give it a decent burial to the spirit of God. Romans 8, 12 and 13. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh. No, we owe it nothing. To live after the flesh, but if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if through the Spirit you put to death or mortify or crucify the deeds of the body, in other words, the acts, sinful acts of the flesh, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him so that we may be glorified together. And this is in context of this whole teaching with Hebrews 12. While we undergo discipline, it's painful, but later on it produces the peaceful fruits of righteousness. Because God calls us to, to answer the upward call of God in Christ unto mature sonship. Hebrews 2 declares, for the, desires, the Father's desire is to bring many sons to glory. But many of most are complacent. They don't take up their cross. They saved born again civilians and they camp at the foot of the mountain like the Israelites worshipping the golden calves of earthly distraction and fleshly desires. The sons of God are like the Mos like Moses who pursue God into that mountain. And it's it's it, it involves discipline and dying to self, and it causes suffering. 
But then God encourages us, verse 18 of Romans 8, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. And these are those who are brought to maturity, pursue God into his mountain. They don't camp it in the valley of complacency. On the level of salvation. For the joy set before us to be united with Christ, sharing his likeness, his holy nature and image. We as disciples are called to endure the spiritual crucifixion process of our own cross and discipline until he's completely stripped us of ourselves. Matthew 10, he that loves anything more than me, in other words, being distracted from the on from answering the upward call of God in Christ. He's not worthy of that place. Although you are saved, but there's a price to pay for sonship, to attain to mature sonship in that glory realm, to sit with him in his throne. And he that takes not his cross, his own cross, and follows after me is not worthy of me. God's sons are called to join Jesus in the harvest fields where souls are being saved and rescued and delivered from the kingdom of darkness. But so few make themselves available to be used of God to make a difference in this world. The fruit of the Spirit speaks about mature maturity because fruit is the mature stage of the seed. But the seed must first die to bring forth fruit. And this is in a way, as we lay ourselves down in the way of the cross. And the instrument that works this required repentance unto the death of self is the cross. So many only embrace the salvation aspect of the ministry of the cross. Few embrace the slaying part by which we are made fruitful in the Father's kingdom. The seed must be sown to bring forth a harvest. Otherwise, it just stays a seed. If Satan can keep you disobedient to the call of the cross, then he will destroy the personal harvest of your destiny. Like he says in 1 Corinthians 3, you will escape through fire. This is the importance of understanding the revelation of the cross that Jesus instructed his followers to be, and which Satan hates because the work and power of the cross destroys self-centeredness and baptizes the disciple in the power and the passion of God's love. It fulfills the law of love demonstrated in the life of Christ. John 15, this is my commandment that you love. This is the commandment of the Melchizedek priesthood, love. It's the law of the Melchizedek priesthood that we become love. It's the message of Christ. Hebrews 7, a new covenant under a new priesthood with new laws. And the law is love to be crucified yourself because when the flesh is dead you become love then you naturally obey you operate by the nature of God's love become partake of his divine nature and again such is no law you cannot command a, an obedient lover to do anything because he naturally obeys God by nature <laughs> The law of love. And that's why it's a war. By, by, by allowing a personal invasion of the word of God, Jesus Christ, into your life. Hebrews 4 verse 12. The word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder between spirit, soul, joints, and marrow. In other words, you must allow him to cut yourself, the self, the flesh, into pieces. It's the circumcision of the heart to cut away everything fleshly, earthly, sensual, fallen, and devilish. It's like the outer court of the veil or the inner court realm, the veil that separates the soul from the Holy of Holies, 
must be ripped open from top to bottom through the death of self so that you can enter the glory of God and His glory can enter you and you become one with Him. And vision, desire, and purpose and that you may see Him clearly. Like the man that was born blind in John chapter 9 that the works of God might be displayed in his life because the gospel is illustrated in that man's life. We are born again, but we're spiritually blind. And then we have to obey because God calls us or sends us daily to the bath of Bethesda, which is the Ephesians 5, 25, cleansing us through the washing of the water through the word. And the reason why Jesus spat in the dirt, God said to me, is because we are all blinded by the dirt of this world. The ways of this world blinds us to the ways of God. So we have to apply the water of the word to wash the dirt of, of this world out of our lives so that we can see Jesus clearly. You see, in the law of Christ, a new commandment give, I give unto you, new priesthood with new laws. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love as I have loved you. No greater love is a man than to lay down his life for his friends. It's the way of the cross. It's the gospel of the cross. Christ crucified. We are called to lay ourselves down in the way of the cross in obedience to Christ and to the death of self. Because when self is crucified, there is no law. It's the law of love fulfilled in us. And love is the fulfillment of the law. Christ is the end of the law. And we become like Him. We become partakers of His divine nature because love is a fruit of the Spirit. And we grow in love. We begin with a born-again seed. Love, which is a fruit of the Spirit, is the mature stage of the born-again seed. But for the born-again seed to become love, it must be crucified to self. It must fall into the ground and dies answering the upward call of God in Christ. Like any seed, if it desires to bring forth fruits, if it desires to produce the harvest, invested in it, hidden in it, locked away in it, the principle of a seed, then the seed must be sown. It must fall into the ground and dies. Like Jesus said in John 14, 12, unless the kernel of wheat falls into the ground, the ground, it remains a single seed. In other words, you're a born-again baby of the incorruptible seed of the word of God, but you are selfish and self-centered and live for yourself, and you are offended at the price that love requires. Because to become love, you must follow Jesus in the way of the cross and allow the, the, the slaying aspect of the cross to put you to death, to bring you to the end of yourself mortifying the deeds of the body, like it says in Colossians 3 as well. And this is a part of the gospel that few understand and apply to their lives. And God is busy wakening up His people to the reality of this apostolic message. The Spirit of God showed me the following about this end time harvest that's coming forth out of the bride. Matthew thirteen twenty four. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who sowed good seeds in the field, his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. But when the plant was sprung up, and brought forth fruit, and appeared the tares also. So the servants of the house hold it, came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field from where then has it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Will you then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay. Lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. 
Let them both grow until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you, the, gather, gather you together first the tears and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. We are called to fruitfulness, precious people of God. And we are called to allow ourselves to be threshed on the threshing floor of our God and Savior to be winnowed so that God can winnow out the tears in us so that it can bring forth the wheat, the good part in us. There's a principle to this, but it also speaks of the gathering of the goats and the sheep in the end time when it comes to judge. But we must be threshed. God must thresh out the wheat from the tares. And this is also part why the a part of the reason why the church will go through tribulation, where many miss this, because tribulation means tribulum. It means to thresh. The purpose of the shaking of nations that cause tribulation in the earth, earth is to thresh out the wheat from the tares. The threshing of the nation to gather the harvest. <laughs> 